You know, a lot of times when we're dealing with life and we're dealing with kingdom, how many know that we go from faith to faith and glory to glory? That there are changes, there are seasons for a lot of things. And I think right now we're at, the, at, a, at a season of change even with our own ministry. God has begun changing the paradigm. And uh, as I get into this, into this lesson, one of the things that I feel with the kingdom of God is that there's a whole lot more. We're just scratching the surface. And so when you, when you get deeper, things have got to change. God changes things with you. God changes your perspective. I even know with the school, God had us change beginning August 1st. Uh, you know, usually with a non-traditional school, you just want to get in all the enrollments you possibly can, and, and you just advertise and push and push. We're not doing that anymore. We're, we're going to be just simply interested in investing in the remnant the same way as we're doing everything else. And so, because I, I think that as, as we go on, guys, the, the direction that the body of Christ is going is completely in the wrong direction. That the seeker-friendly church is destroying the church. You know, when, when I read the book of Acts, they weren't seeking, they weren't seeker friendly, they were Messiah friendly, they were Holy Spirit friendly, they were kingdom of God friendly, and they would change whatever they needed to change to adapt themselves into what they were learning in the kingdom, about the kingdom of God. And what we have done is we have allowed the mystery religions to so infiltrate everything that we do that... Guys, I believe that there's probably, it, it, even in evangelical churches today, the ones that get saved are kind of getting saved by accident. Come on now. It's, it's, and, and what I'm seeing, I'm not seeing a lot of fruit in a lot of people's lives that say that they're Christians. And Jesus said, by their fruit you would know them. And so I'm sensing there's more. And as we press in the days ahead, I'm going to begin investing a whole lot more in writing. I want to dig deeper because I'm wanting more. I am dissatisfied with where I am in, in my walk with God. And I think all of us have to have that, that holy discontent so that we dig deeper. And I, I think it's God-ordained. No one can do it for you. And this, this is something that, for some reason, I have a hard time getting across for people. You know, that people want to look at a man or a woman or a movement to be a fix for things. The only fix is Jesus. And it's how deep you go in Him. And the deeper you go in Him, the more of Mystery Babylon He takes off of you. And when, when you try to get people to fill it, you destroy what ministry is. And you're looking to the wrong place. You end up trying to make idols out of even those in ministry. And guys, it, it comes back, let's, let's serve Jesus, let's follow Jesus, let's, let's understand the dynamics of the kingdom and be faithful citizens to the kingdom. There is one king, his name is Jesus, and the closer that we get to his return, the more he is going to resemble Messiah ben David than he did Messiah ben Joseph. That ought to make you swallow hard twice because when Messiah ben David comes, anything that doesn't line up with him gets chopped off. So and instead of being seeker-friendly, worldly-friendly, you better learn how to be a Messiah ben David-friendly for the days that are coming ahead. That was a word from our sponsor before we get into everything we're getting into today. You know, in our last lesson, we discovered that repentance is the only way to enter into the kingdom. Any major move of God, if it doesn't begin with repentance, you're not going anywhere. Absolutely not. So all these people that said that they got saved without repentance are not saved. 
any movement that tells you that once you accept Jesus, there's nothing left to repent of, are lying through their teeth. They're preaching another gospel because the, the whole art of sanctification, God takes us through layers of repentance so that our salvation can go deeper. I'm tired of veneer Christianity. We discovered that the giving of the Holy Spirit is directly connected to Him teaching us the law of God and enabling us to live it. If the Holy Spirit on the inside of you isn't pointing back to the commandments of God and empowering you to do it, it's another spirit. The foundational concept of the new birth is that the Torah of God would be written on our hearts. And our problem is our theologies get us off of what God has established in our hearts. Paul pointed out in the book of Romans that Gentile believers never being taught the law were being obedient to the law because of that new nature they received when they received Messiah. And so now we're saying that he did away with the very thing that the Apostle Paul offered to the Jews as proof of what they had through Messiah was superior to what they had under traditional Judaism. Now, I made the statement that the, you were, you know, those who were far off, those that were near, but those you know, were brought near so that we could step into something greater. I want to go to Matthew chapter 21. Because sometimes when we read, we don't understand that everything, there, there's, there's salvic issues and there are kingdom issues. Now prior to the cross, uh, every, everything else on planet earth except for Israel was based upon mystery Babylon. It was based upon the Shinar directive that Nimrod established in the, in the valley of Shinar in his war against God to hunt men and draw them from God. And the only contrast to that is Almighty God said, out of those 72 nations, I will pull a man, his name was Abram, and I'm going to make him a prince of God, and I'm going to make a nation out of him. And it was only in that nation that the kingdom was accessible. But then we read later on, like in, in the book of Hebrews, where it's, it's, it's contrasting uh, but, but the, what the Jews had without Messiah. says, now this system is, slowly pa is, is quickly passing away. And we think he's dealing with a salvic issue. He's not dealing with a salvic issue. He's dealing with a kingdom issue. That without Jesus, there is no access to the kingdom. It wasn't doing away with the commandments of God because they define what's right and wrong. It was that with trying to simply walk as a Jew without Messiah, from the, from the cross on, you can no longer access the kingdom. There's not an anomaly like David or Samuel or Solomon or others that had access to the kingdom that now it is impossible because Jesus is the door to the kingdom. And with him, that kingdom is now accessible to all. He was, Jesus did not lower the standard. The Apostle Paul never lowered the standard. Man, they raised it. We, we, have been bought, we have been sold this lie that because of Jesus, God lowers the standard and puts up with our carnality and puts up with mystery Babylon. You miss the point of the whole gospel. We were delivered out of that mess into something greater, and the standard is higher because Jesus set the standard. So, he begins dealing with them, and he actually prophesies in this parable what's going to happen, as well as he reveals to them and calls them out that they're already planning to kill him. Starting in verse 33. Here, another parable, there was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. Now he's dealing here, the vineyard was Israel. He set a tower, he set walls of protection, and there are times, and guys, we need to understand this, with each generation, there are times that God withdraws himself to see what we do, if we're actually going to be faithful when he's not there, we're not getting Holy Ghost goosebumps all the time. 
And then he comes to visit to see how we're being faithful to these things. So there's ebbs and flows to the kingdom of God. And so Israel, he established Israel. Then he drew them himself back to see if they would be faithful. And what we see over and over again in all the, mist, in all the Old Testament is they kept running off to Baal. They ran off to Ashtaroth, to Molech. Let's go on. And when the time of the fruit was near, the time for the harvest, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruit of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. What's Jesus referring to here? The prophets. That God would send the prophets, call them back to receive the fruit that was due him. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did to them likewise. But at last, but last of all, he, said unto, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Let, come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. And when the Lord there of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto these husbandmen? So he's saying this is the situation. He sent his servants, the prophets. They stoned him, they killed him. He sent his son. They, they, had, they had lost the fact that it was his kingdom, not their kingdom. That's why I have the big problem with something called Christendom. It doesn't exist. It's mystery Babylon with a veneer of, of, of Christianity over the top of it that the Catholic Church used to conquer the earth. We are never supposed to conquer the earth. It's not through laws, men's laws and legislation or taking over governments. Do you know what brings righteousness to a land? Is when you capture the hearts of men and they turn their hearts to Jesus. So said Jesus says what? What, is, what should he do? And they said unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which will render him the fruit in their season. And what they're doing is they're actually signifying their judgment. They pronounced it. He didn't. They pronounced it. Now look what Jesus says. And Jesus said unto them, did ye never read in the scripture the stone which the builders rejected, the same it has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to another nation, bringing forth the fruit thereof. And immediately the story goes on. They wanted to stone him to death right there. Not because he blasphemed God, but because he showed them that they're no longer even interested in following God. It was about their political power and their own agenda, which is going on in many, many Protestant denominations today. The exact same thing. Now what's interesting, he says, now the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to another, or given to uh, a nation bringing forth fruit. In the, in the uh, Greek, Matthew uses the word ethnos. Okay, Now ethnos means a multitude, whether of men or of beasts, associated or living together, a company, a troop, a swarm, a multitude of individuals of the same nature, our, our genus, the human race. But I, I love this. This was, by the time we get here, this word ethnos has already been used by the rabbis for a specific purpose. Listen to this. In the Old Testament, foreign nations not worshiping the true God, pagans, or Gentiles. And then Paul uses the term for Gentile Christians. He literally was saying, God's going to go get the Gentiles and give them the kingdom because they're gone. He, he was prophesying Cornelius' home. He was prophesying the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Because without you can have Moses and not have Jesus, and you can't function in the kingdom for the last 2,000 years. 
But let me tell you something. You can have Jesus and not have Moses and still not know how to walk in the kingdom. Okay. In fact, ethnos is used 164 times in the King James Bible. 93 of those 164 times is translated Gentile. 64 times is translated nation and five times is translated heathen. Because God said, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and go ahead and after the Gentiles, it's going to go forth because I'm restoring my kingdom. I'm going to go get my children that were stolen from me. Either by the Nahesh in the garden or by Nimrod, I'm going to go back and get those that will hear my voice. The thing is, we've not walked in the kingdom. We've made it something else because we have allowed. It only took 325 years. By 325 A.D., the mystery religions co-opted Christianity. The only true believers ran to the hills when, when Constantine took over. The Anabaptists and others. And what's interesting, and contrary to what the Baptist group that I belonged to when I was being raised said, because they said they came from the Anabaptists, all the Anabaptists were Sabbath-keeping, feast-keeping believers that understood the commandments of God. That's why over and over again, the Roman Catholic Church had to pass laws saying, if we catch you doing the feast, if we catch you keeping the commandments, if we catch you keeping Sabbath, we're going to kill you. They had to do that almost 200 years after the establishment of Constantine because Christians that wanted to really walk with God and not walk in Christendom because they knew exactly what it was were keeping the commandments the way the apostles taught them to keep them. Now one of the things that I want to press in today on is when we start walking in kingdom and we start walking in salvation. Salvation is so much more than what we've been taught. It is so much more. Now first, it is the forgiveness of sins. Aren't you glad? Because we need, we need to, to have this change and have our sins forgiven. Romans 5, 6 through 9 says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet preadventure for a good man some would dare even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we have been, we shall be saved from wrath through him. I love that. Forgiveness of sin. But let me tell you something, guys. The first step to forgiveness of sin is saying, I'm sorry. Come on. If someone has done you wrong, there can be no reconciliation until they come to you and say, I was wrong. I am sorry. What do I need to do to make it right? If it's that way with you, why is it not that way with God? The cross didn't change that. The cross just made an avenue to where we could come to him and say, I receive what Jesus did for me at the cross. I repent of my sins. I'm sorry. I turn my back on that. I'm getting ready to go another way. And I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. So if you have a salvation that didn't include sorry, please forgive me maybe you're not as saved as you think you are. The second thing is that we received a new nature. Adam in the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, he was infused with the iniquity force that was drawn from the heart of Lucifer. He was separated from God. That was the mistake of the first Adam. Jesus, the second Adam, came. And because of what he did, when I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I receive his atoning work by faith. I trust in him. The Holy Spirit causes my spirit man to be born again. 
I receive a new nature. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. All things are what? Well, you know, it's not things of the flesh. It's not even things of the mind. We're going to have to work on that. It's your spirit man. The real you has been born again. And that spirit man wants to walk in the ways of God. But what I found interesting when I began to research this in the Greek, uh, the Greek word there for creature is tiskus, which means not only the act of founding, establishing, or building, it was also used after rabbinical usage by which a man converted from idolatry to Judaism was called a new creature. When you left your pagan ways and begin walking in the ways of God, the rabbis called that you became a new creature. And Paul is saying you can only get that through Jesus. You see, the, this new creation is inexplicably connected to the commandments of God because my want to on the inside has come in line with thou shalt do. And on the inside, that new birth, that new spirit that's been born, on, on his heart has been written, thou shalt not, and he don't want to do. But the problem is, our software up here, not in the heart up here, is still trained to think the ways of Babylon. And therefore, we're falling short of who we really are in Christ. Because there's this conflict going on. And the next thing you know, we start changing our theologies, not to match what has been done in our heart, but to align itself with our head. And then we become seeker-friendly. Well, we don't want to offend anybody. Sin needs to be offended, slapped down, stomped on, called wrong. Mystery Babylon needs to be called out, highlighted, get away from that, never do it. It's toxic. We're falling so far short of what's accessible to us. You see, this sermon today is my desire to dig deeper into the kingdom, dig deeper into the word. I know there's more. Well, Mike, why aren't you digging? Because we're so busy dealing with those who won't dig and won't deal. We really are. We're dealing with, you know, when when you get my age, you shouldn't be looking for affirmation. You should be giving it. Actually, this probably needs to happen around (laughs) 30-ish. But what we're, we're... we're, we are consumed with people affirming us instead of realizing that the moment I got saved, I was affirmed in God. Come on now. I have been made acceptable in the beloved. Why do I care what you think? If your mystery Babylon raises up against me, walk in the kingdom, tough beans. I don't care. But what we've done, well, Mike, you need to tone yourself down. You need to, you need to, because you're you're making Babylon nervous. Good. I want to make Babylon nervous. I want to make the devil nervous. I want to get to the place that when I wake up in the morning, he goes, oh no, look who woke up. Instead of me waking up in the morning going, oh no, I woke up. You know, it's like, oh no, I got to face this. There's, there's so much more. But what we got to do is we've got to balance it out. We cannot have other people meet a need in us that only Jesus of Nazareth can meet. Because what we do is we end up making idols of those that are servants of God. And a true servant of God will stop and say, Don't put me on a pedestal because the only thing God can do for my sake and yours is to knock me off of it. Come on now. It, 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 it is time that we, we change some things. We, even how we treat ministers, how we, how we treat those that are serving God, 
it, it's not what we see in the New Testament. It's what we see the world says, and we just extrapolate it over to how we treat people in the kingdom. How I many know preachers are not rock stars? People act like that. We don't see that in the New Testament. The one time they tried to do it, Paul shut it down. They started looking to him like they were gods. He said, whoa, 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 whoa. We're, we're just servants. We're just flesh and blood just like you. We just, we just learned how to walk with God. It has to come back. It's kingdom. It's, it's really finding out, really repenting to the place where this new nature begins to take a hold. It's not only given a new nature in, Col in Colossians 1, 12 and 14. It says, Thanks be unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of light, who hath delivered us. That is past tense. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, the kingdom of darkness, the power of darkness, into the kingdom of his dear son. The moment you got born again, you should have died to the world. You're no longer citizens of this world. You are like Abram, who is a stranger in a strange land, who's looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Therefore, that other kingdom can no longer guide me, lead me, sustain me, or define me. I'm wanting more. Let's go to Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Now the Greek word here for salvation is soteria which we get the word soteriology from in theology is the study of salvation. And it means deliverance, preservation, safety, salvation. And I like this next one. Deliverance from the molestation of enemies. Jack, most Christian salvation is nowhere near there. You see, molestation is something personal. It's something right here. It's not something that's afar off. As long as I have Babylon still floating around in my head, and, I begin, and I'm still thinking as a Babylonian citizen, and I'm functioning as a Babylonian citizen, I give the kingdom of darkness access on a very personal level into my life. That's, that's why understanding the commandments is so important. When I keep the commandments, I'm closing the, every, every act of obedience that I do to God's Word. I'm closing the door to the devil, and I'm opening a door to God. That's part of the salvation process. It's part of the renewing of the mind for the salvation of the saving of the soul. James chapter 1. But most Christians, most ministry today that is going on that's not simply teaching believers how to walk with God is because they're being molested by the enemy within, not harassed by the enemy without. And I think part of it is by the way that we lead people to Christ. You get a little emotional and say this little 30-second prayer. How many know the way most of us live before we found Jesus? It needs to be a 30-minute, 30 30-hour. 30 <laughs> it needs to be a real prayer. And part of that needs to be, I renounce Satan. I renounce the kingdom of darkness. I renounce mystery Babylon. I reject it as no longer a part of my life. God, come and deliver me and drive, give me the power of God to drive the ites out of my life. For the most part, I think Mary and I have gotten to the place where it's not molestation from within, it's harassment from without. 
Every once in a while, something will show up and God will say, hey, that's one thing you didn't remember that you need to pray about, get it out. Drive that it out of your border. That's the whole principle that we see when we read after Joshua and them got into the promised land while they were slaves in Egypt, the ites took over the land. And to bring the kingdom in, you got to drive out the ites. That's part of the salvation process. It's done through repentance and it's done in empowerment and it's done by learning to walk in the kingdom. And I cannot drive out your ites. They're personal ites <laughs> that you've got to drive out. You've got to say, as far as me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I'm going to obey the commandments. I'm going to command them to still their voices. I'm going to command them to get out of the border. And I'm going to drive them out of the borders of my life and establish a hedge round about me that I am going to be faithful to the God who redeemed me. That's all a part of our salvation process. This 30-second prayer isn't making it, guys. We have, we have boatloads of Christians that are going to end up split in hell wide open when they die. They're going to say, Lord, Lord, and Jesus is going to say, you lawless ones, I never knew you. You workers of iniquity, lawlessness. And he wasn't talking about the laws of America. He was talking about the laws that he gave Moses. Now, did the apostle John believe this about freedom of molestation from the enemy? 1 John chapter 5, starting in verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Uh-oh, that sounds like a new creature with a new feature. That he's walking with God, he's keeping the commandments of God. He, that that, that born-again spirit does not want to violate the commandments of God because this same apostle that wrote this said, violation of God's commandments or law is still sin 30 years after the apostle Paul went on to be in glory. Still the same thing. And he's saying anyone born of God wants to walk in the commandments of God does not want to sin. But, he puts, but that he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. Now what's that talking about? Keeping himself pure. Keeping himself in the ways of God, in the commandments of God, in this new kingdom, out of the other kingdom. And the wicked one toucheth him not. It's external, not internal. How we know external things are a whole lot easier to handle? Yeah. When they're outside your wall, yeah. they can beat their chest, they can scream all they want to, but they're outside. It's a whole nother thing when you're trying to hold your ground and, you're, and, you're, and your enemy is sticking you in the back with, with, a, with a dagger because you've let him in your house because of your disobedience. Now he goes on to say, now listen to this contrast. Born of God, not sinning. He's keeping himself from the darkness. The wicked one cannot touch him. And we know that we are of God. And the whole world lieth in wickedness. Well, if the whole world's lying in wickedness, why are you worried about what they think? I'm tired of Christianity looking at whatever's happened and trying to reclaim it for Christ. You know, there's, there's the, the whole thing of getting Christian tattoos when the Word of God says, Thou shalt not get a tattoo, I am the Lord thy God. So it doesn't matter. It's a violation. You, you can't violate one of God's principles to bring God honor. We're so afraid that the world is not going to want what we have but the only way that they can want what we have, it has to be in complete contrast to what they got. Because if we don't, 
then we're just proving we're just another variant of the mystery religions of Babylon that scattered 72 ways at the Tower of Babel. We just have a different variant, but we're in the same club. We are completely different. We are not of this world the moment that we get saved. For we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true and that we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Amen. That's the end of his letter. Keep yourself from idols. Keep yourself from the things of mystery Babylon so that you're no longer being molested by the enemy. But he's on the outside looking in. Spiritual warfare becomes so much greater in your life when he's on the outside beating on the wall. Because once he, if you understand tactics and you understand warfare, the moment that the wall is breached, the war is lost. And what we've done is we've created housing complexes within our walls that Mystery Babylon, you know, it's our bed and breakfasts that we rent out to them because, you know, we want to feel, you know, it's because we, we have these needs. That's the needs of your old man that you're required of God to crucify. Get them out of your house. Get them out of, out of this house. Get them out of this house. When you get them out of this house and this house, it's easy to get them out your house. Because they start looking ugly to you. I look at what people are running after anymore, and I'm thinking, what on earth? Grown adults playing Pokemon Go. Pokemon is short for pocket monster, and I made Pokemon Go a long time ago when I made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of my house. I said, demons, you got to go. I'm not hunting you down. I'm not capturing you. I'm not training you. I'm kicking you out of my house. And it has gotten so bad that employers, I saw the sign in this one New York firm, it says, if I catch you playing Pokemon Go in this building and you leave the building, just keep on going because you've lost your job. And then they put, and it's a sad thing that I actually had to put up the sign to tell grown adults they need to be working instead of playing games at work. Whatever craze. It's all a test. You don't, it's mystery Babylon testing this to see how stuck on stupid we are. The guy who, the, the, by his own testimony, the guy who originated Pokemon was raised in a Christian family, rejected that, and is a Satanist. He is an occultist, becoming rich over everybody playing Pokemon Go. So Christian, if you're playing Pokemon Go, you're stuffing the coffers of hell with the money God's blessed you with. And it's just a test because one of these days is who could receive the mark first? Right. Woohoo! You get a prize. Yeah, it's called hell. You know, but can, can you see how they're, all, all these things are psyops that they're doing just to see how much of Babylon we will swallow? I'm getting to where I gag at the smell of Babylon. I don't want it anywhere near me. I want more. I want the kingdom. If it doesn't smell like Jesus, look like Jesus, act like Jesus, the Jesus that is revealed in the Word of God, I do not want any part of it. And what I am finding out more and more, most churches have created another Jesus that lines up with their denomination. Instead of worrying about if the denomination lines up with the real Jesus. Because he's coming back and those that do not line up with him are going to be removed. Come on, that's the whole parable of the wheat and the tares. Oh, man, it's time for us to hit our knees. It's time for us. There's so much more. 
There's so much more to the kingdom. There's so much more to our salvation. There's so much more in this word of God. Uh, I, I like what Dr. Michael Heiser says about the word. He says, I dare you, pick any place. I dare you to bore me with it. It is so powerful. It is so living that if you know how to get in the word, you start getting happy about all the begats. You start looking at all the different pieces of the tabernacle. You see more revelations of who Jesus is. How everything fit together. It's, it's, it's a wonder about who Jesus is. You look at the service in the temple. You find out what Jesus is doing for us. It is a powerful, powerful thing. And people are like, I don't get nothing out of it. Well, that's probably because you're not born again. If you're born again and the Holy Spirit starts working, you may only catch every other word for a while. And you get little snippets here and there and, it begins, and you begin developing tools on how to dig. But this is a marvelous thing. It is a miracle. It's actually a living book that the one who wrote it moved on the inside of you and says, if you start reading that thing, I'll start making sense of it to you and I'll start teaching it to you. And I'll make it real. It's time for the kingdom to be real. It's time for what Jesus did for us to be real. I am sick and tired of religious spirits that make you want to gag at what they call Christianity. I want the real thing. I want to have the joy of my salvation. I want to see the power of his resurrection. I want to see all these things. And to do that, we got to dig deeper. Don't ever be satisfied with where you are in God. There's always more. There is always more. Father, we just thank you today for your word. Father, I thank you that your word will not return to you void, but will accomplish whereunto you have sent it. And Father, I ask today for every person that listens to this message that they will begin hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Because the promise of Messiah is when you start hungering and thirsting after the righteousness that comes from the kingdom, you shall be filled. And Father, I ask that you would fulfill this in our lives, fulfill it in our hearing, and Father, fulfill it in our families, we ask. In Jesus' name. Are you hungry for the truth? Then come to Hear the Watchman Part 2, September 30th through October 2nd at the Knoxville Marriott in Knoxville, Tennessee. This is an advanced once-in-a-lifetime end times knowledge and prophecy event you don't want to miss. We are at the end of the age, and God is raising up His remnant people. You will witness the wisdom of Pastor Paul Begley, L.A. Marzulli, Anthony Patch, Dr. Michael Lake, Russ Didzar, John Reagan, Josh Tolley, Coach Dave Daubenmeyer, Michael Boldia, and John B. Wells. So sound the alarm. God has strategically placed this conference exactly at the 70th Jubilee. Learn to take authority over the enemy with cutting-edge material by these amazing men of God. This event will sell out, so book your room and tickets now. Go to hearthewatchman.com. That's hearthewatchman.com. And if God is tugging at your heart, be obedient. Come and hear the Watchman Knoxville and receive unprecedented knowledge and be transformed.